Greetings, it's your host, Gabe Morales, with another segment in our series on police corruption. I have visited New York City many times, including visiting there one month after 9-11. And just like all agencies, the New York Police Department has had some great officers over the years who have served gallantly, and those still in uniform who continue to do so to protect and serve New Yorkers. But it has also had problems with some officers who make it very hard to distinguish between the good guys and the bad guys. Today we allege two separate and serious criminal schemes involving the bribery of officers who were sworn to uphold the rule of law. In one, private citizens we allege spent well over $100,000 for all manner of official police actions. They got in effect a private police force for themselves and their friends. Effectively, they got cops on call. And in the other, offices subverted public safety by putting hard-to-get gun licenses essentially up for sale. And what was the result of this alleged corruption? Not surprisingly, gun licenses were issued to people who had no business having them. In all, we have charged four senior NYPD officers one has already pled guilty. When corruption subverts public safety, that is especially tough to take. It can tear at the very fabric of society. It makes people wonder whether those entrusted to protect and serve them are in fact doing that. That is why cases like this are so important, and that is why we pursue and prosecute public corruption vigorously wherever we find it. NYPD was established on May 23rd, 1845, and it is currently the largest and one of the oldest police agencies in the entire United States. Today, NYPD employs over 50,000 people, including more than 35,000 uniformed officers. Throughout the history of NYPD, numerous instances of corruption, misconduct, and other negative allegations have occurred. This goes back to even the early days, when sometimes New York cops would demand payment before they would return stolen items back to victims. And they engaged in other abuses of power. This went on unchecked for almost 50 years, when in 1894, the agency was forced to address corruption problems via an investigative body called the Lexall Committee. They uncovered all kinds of wrongdoing, like taking bribes for not ticketing vehicles parked in front of restaurants, and larger crimes like counterfeiting, extortion, election fraud, and police brutality. In 1895, future U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt became president of the NYPD Police Commission, and under his leadership, many reforms were instituted. Some NYPD officers were well known for police brutality. Many times this happened on an individual basis, but sometimes during civil unrest, such as the Harlem Riots of 1943, when a white policeman shot a black man who was a World War II veteran. Crowds flooded the streets, hurling rocks at officers and breaking windows, causing an estimated $5 million in damages. Mayor LaGuardia, for which one of New York's airports are named after, blamed radical elements in Harlem but many black Harlem community leaders disagreed and stated that there was a smoldering resentment against the government, which was taken out on police due to Jim Crow laws that were implemented on segregated U.S. forces during the war and due to the high rents in the Harlem ghetto, mostly populated by poor African Americans. Mayor LaGuardia ended up bringing in the National Guard, and by the end of the riot, five people had been killed with hundreds more injured. In 1965, James Powell, a 15-year-old black youth, was killed by two white off-duty police officers on the Upper East Side. Again, the Harlem community rioted, looting occurred, as well as property damage. The rioting then spread to Brooklyn, in the Bed-Stuy area, and into South Jamaica, Queens, all areas with a high African-American population. And NYPD responded with gunfire. Some state that they actually ran out of bullets. Hundreds of people were also injured in that disturbance, as well as one person killed. Mayor Robert F. Wagner defended police actions, saying it was done on behalf of the people of Harlem, Brooklyn, and Queens. But many blacks disagreed, as many of them had personally experienced police brutality and injustice. In December 1986, 11 police officers were arrested from NYPD's 77th Precinct. This became known as the Buddy Boys case. It was found that officers knocked down doors, 
stole money and drugs from dealers, then resold them on the streets, and they ran extortion rackets. Eventually, 13 officers were indicted. Many minorities in New York City point to more recent cases of discrimination and harassment by police by using the example of the Central Park jogger case. This occurred after a white woman named Trisha Maley was assaulted and raped in Central Park on April 19, 1989. On the night of the attack, there had been dozens of teenagers roaming around. At that time, I remember they called it wilding, when kids basically went on the loose, hollering and carrying on, often under the influence of drugs and alcohol. And on that night, there were several reports of muggings and assaults. Six black and Latino teenagers were arrested for her rape and assault, but charges against one were dropped. Five others spent almost 10 years in prison before a serial rapist named Matias Reyes admitting to being the sole perpetrator of that crime, and DNA backed up his confession. All of these youth later alleged they were forced into giving false confessions by abuse of investigators, and that their Miranda rights had been violated. These men were given sentences between 7 and 13 years. By that time, some of them had spent a decade in prison. This was time that they could never get back, and their convictions were vacated. All five defendants who were convicted sued the city for malicious prosecution, racial discrimination, and emotional distress, and the city ended up settling that case for $41 million. During the course of his career, Officer Michael Dowd committed a host of crimes, conspiring with drug traffickers to distribute cocaine, warning other drug dealers, about upcoming raids, even sometimes providing them with guns and badges so they could do home invasion robberies on other dealers. And he was so low in one case that it is alleged that he stole food meant for the needy at a church food bank. In one case, he found a man who had ripped off a drug trafficking organization and turned him over to the group. It is alleged that Dowd pocketed thousands of dollars every week for his crimes, but he was finally arrested in 1992 and convicted of racketeering. He ended up taking a plea bargain and cooperated with the Molin Commission, which was set up to investigate corruption within NYPD. So he was only given 16 years in prison, of which he only served about 12 and a half. As a result of Dowd's cooperation, several other police officers were arrested for corruption. And in 2014, there was a documentary made about Dowd and his crime partner's case called The 7-5. As I mentioned in previous episodes, the drug war has been pretty scandalous for many unscrupulous police officers who used it to become rich. In the 1990s at Harlem's 30th Precinct, which was the crack cocaine capital of the city at that time, officers confiscated nearly a million dollars alone in 1994, and some of that money ended up in their pockets. Some of the cocaine is alleged to even have been sold out of the precinct. Like I said, this is more than just pocketing a few dollars here and there or snorting a few lines of the evidence. Under the supervision of Sergeant Kevin Nannery, his crew, called Nannery's Raiders, organized a major drug distribution network. And eventually, they were busted too, after a brave undercover cop named Barry Brown brought down the corrupt crew. In the end, all told, 33 officers were arrested in that scam. On August 9, 1997, it is said that NYPD officer... Justin Volpe, who worked in Brooklyn, sodomized a man in his custody by the name of Abner Luima using a broken broom handle in a 70th precinct bathroom. Volpe eventually pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 30 years in federal prison for that offense. Other officers were implicated in a cover-up, and Luima, who suffered trauma for the rest of his life, settled with the city for $8.75 million dollars. On February 4th, 1999, four plainclothes NYPD officers assigned to the Street Crimes Unit fired a combined 41 shots at Amado Diallo, killing him instantly. They later stated that they mistook him for a since-convicted rapist. Diallo was found to be unarmed, and all of these officers were acquitted in 2000, but the city of New York ended up paying out $3 million to Diallo's parents. And a few years later, the Street Crimes Unit was disbanded. There was also the case of a couple of NYPD detectives named Louis Epolito and Stefan Caracapa, who were found to routinely violate the rights of New York City citizens during the day while they moonlighted for the mafia at night. These two corrupt detectives would use police files to track down enemies of the mafia and were ultimately convicted in several murders, including an innocent man who had the same name as one of the individuals the mafia sought. Before they were caught, both detectives had moved to Las Vegas, where they continued to work for the mob. 
It is alleged that the two detectives even tried to kill Sammy the Bull Gravano, who had testified against his boss, Gambino crime family leader John Gotti. Epolito ended up receiving life in prison for his crimes with an additional 100 years. Caracapa was given life plus 80 years, and they were fined $4 million. Caracapa ended up dying in federal prison in 2017, while Epozito passed in 2019. Now, many cops contest that they break the law and will just say that they are aggressive cops. And I know some really good cops who get a lot of complaints from citizens because they do their job, but they know where the line is. Sometimes it is stated that the line is too hard. And one of the arguments against the broken windows theory, which is basically zero tolerance to crime, which was first pushed by NYPD Police Commissioner William Bratton, is the Eric Garner case. On July 17, 2014, a black man named Eric Garner was approached by a plainclothes police officer while he was standing in front of a beauty store in Staten Island, a borough which has traditionally been majority white. As I recall, Garner was trying to sell single cigarettes to passersby, which was basically his hustle. When questioned, he told the officer that he was just minding his business, but that every time the officer saw him, he wanted to mess with him, and he became irate and shouted, it stops today. Garner then raised both his arms, but was taken into a chokehold by another officer from behind. This was all caught on video, and Garner repeatedly cried that he was unable to breathe. The officer struggled to take him down and get him to comply and put his arms behind his back, and he died a few minutes later from asphyxiation. An investigation found that it took seven minutes for officers to give CPR, and the chokehold had been outlawed since 1993 by NYPD over 10 years earlier. As a result of Eric Garner's death, Police Commissioner Bratton ordered an investigation into NYPD's training policies and use of force. So, like I said, police corruption and brutality within NYPD has been a subject of discussion for decades. The Knapp Commission, named after its chairman William Knapp, was a five-man panel first formed in 1970 by then-Mayor John Lindsay to investigate corruption within the department. The creation of this commission was largely as a result of individuals like Detective Frank Seprical and Sergeant David Dirk, who had given testimony about corruption within the department. Uh, he informed me about uh, the pad. Now, the pad, what, uh, what is a pad? Uh, How do you define it? A uh, pad is um, a systemized um, pickup of monies from gamblers uh, in order to um, uh, give them immunity from arrest. We must create an atmosphere in which the dishonest officer fears the honest one and not the other way around. I hope that this investigation and any future ones will deal with corruption at all levels within the department and not limit themselves to cases involving individual patrolmen. In 1992, then-Mayor David Dinkins created an independent civilian complaint review board for NYPD as the result of the Molin Commission report and instituted several other changes that impacted NYPD. In response to this, many NYPD officers protested, and these protests turned violent. They blocked traffic on the Brooklyn Bridge, and several of them shouted racial epithets at Dinkins. It was found that these protests were actually organized by the police union. They marched around City Hall Park in a peaceful and orderly fashion. But then, minutes later, thousands of cops stormed through the barricades and ran on top of cars as they charged the stairs of City Hall. Their message rang loud and clear. These cops were here to put pressure on Mayor David Dinkins, hoping he would reconsider his request for an all-civilian complaint review board. The board hears complaints about city police officers. Right now, it consists of 12 people, equally represented by civilian and police members. These cops don't want it to change, and they had support from the mayor's arch rival, Rudy Giuliani. The reason the morale of the police department of the city of New York is so low is one reason, and one reason alone, David Dinkins! Let's assume this is the worst legislation known to man. It is still no excuse for the behavior that, that at least the reports I've gotten of how they behaved out there today. And I say that Phil Caruso and the leadership of the PBA is responsible and for Rudy Giuliani to, 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 to 
urge them on, as it were. It demonstrates an irresponsibility on his behalf. And so once again, I've said it before, unions have their place, but union powers can also be abused. And I've known of many corrupt and abusive officers who hide behind union rights to justify what they do. One person from my home state of Washington who tried to implement changes in policing was former King County Sheriff Sue Rar. She introduced a new policing model called LEAD, Listen and Explain with Equity and Dignity. I recall her starting this idea back around 2011, and it later influenced her work while she was head of the Washington Criminal Justice Training Center, at which I was a TAC officer for a couple of years and trained on gangs there for over 20 years. Then President Barack Obama appointed RAR to his presidential task force on policing, where her guardian model received a lot of support as an alternative to the warrior mindset model that had been pushed at many police academies for decades. Now, here's the thing. I believe police can be both guardians and warriors. They just have to know when to wear which hat. As I mentioned earlier, Frank Sepulchre blew the lid off in YPD corruption and had his life threatened for it. He worked in the late 1960s and early 70s as a plainclothes police officer, working in Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Manhattan to expose vice racketeering. In 1967, he reported corruption, but it was largely ignored by his bosses. Then in 1970, he contributed to a front-page investigative report by the New York Times, which drew national attention to police misconduct. Frank Serpico was shot in the face during an arrest attempt in February 1971 in Brooklyn. The bullet lodged in his brain, and many people brought attention to his newspaper expose as possibly being a police retaliation setup. There was no formal investigation on that, and his assailant, Edgar Echeverria, was eventually convicted of that crime. But many people still wondered, and his whistleblower status and subsequent shooting were covered in a film called Serpico, where he was portrayed by one of my favorite actors, Al Pacino. I believe Serpico is a classic case of how you can be both guardian and warrior. To date, thousands and thousands of lawsuits have been settled by the city of New York regarding their police forces. And millions, possibly billions of dollars, have been paid out in lawsuits. In just 2019, the city paid out over $68 million. This included approximately $10 million paid out to two individuals who have been falsely convicted and imprisoned. The current New York City mayor is Eric Adams, who previously served as a police officer and retired as a captain in the year 2006. I've been pretty impressed with him. I've seen him on TV speaking, and I know both people in the community and NYPD who think he has been pretty fair, especially compared to some past mayors. It appears to me that he has worked hard to improve both police image and professionalism, as well as police community relations. The current NYPD commissioner is Kichant Sewell, who is the first female to ever be in that position. And her training bureau chief is Juanita Holmes. I wish them and the people in New York City to get respect for police officers and the best policing they deserve. How things go there will likely impact the rest of us in the United States regarding future policing in America. I always try to end my videos on a positive note, so I don't want to forget to give a shout out to all my brothers and sisters working with NYPD who have never forgotten their oath to uphold the law, including with themselves. In particular, I'd like to give props to the National Latino Peace Officers Association, Bronx Chapter. I've been a longtime NLPOA member and know that they do some very good work in cities all over the United States. So please support the NLPOA there in the Big Apple and try to attend some of their events. And that concludes this episode. I hope you found it to be educational and hope you come back to view more shows. Don't forget to hit those like and subscribe buttons. I appreciate all your past comments as it helps me improve this channel and get ideas for future episodes. For now, this is Gabe Morales signing off for Gangsters Cops and Politicians.